welcome if you are new and here for the first time. My name is Jenny and I'm here today to do my August reading wrap up. Uh, I'm going to apologize in advance if you hear construction, trucks, or anything else outside. Um, given the situation during um, COVID-19, finding a quiet place to film has proven to be quite challenging and that's why I'm often in here in my bedroom. Um, but even in here, uh, there's there's sounds coming from everywhere. So I was able to get through 10 books in August, which is pretty good for me. Um, and it, overall, I think it was a pretty good reading month. I like that having that extra day on there at the end of the month to really um, give you like the full maximum amount of time possible to finish up books. So the first book I finished in August was The Siege by Helen Dunmore, and this was a carryover from my July TBR. Uh, this is my second Helen Dunmore book. The first one I read was The Lie, which I loved, 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 and I did enjoy The Siege a lot as well. I thought it was really well done. Um, it takes place in Leningrad during the siege of the city by the Russians during World War II. And it is pretty heavy what um, the people living in Leningrad experienced um, during that time. Extreme hunger because the supply chains were cut off from the rest of Russia for months. And um, despite the best efforts of the people running the city to distribute the food and to uh, ration the food, there was uh, starvation on a very large scale. And so we follow um, one fictional family and their other familial connections throughout this time. Uh, one of them, the father, the patriarch of the family is a writer who, you know, couldn't really write uh, anymore the things he wanted to um, under the Russian government and was kind of being censored. Um, his daughter, who was an aspiring artist but worked in a nursery school because that was what she could do, and she was also raising her young brother, who um, was uh, who, because their mother died um, after childbirth. And so you follow this family and how they make it through this um, really difficult time. And this book actually continues on in another book called The Betrayal and follows um, Anna and her partner and her younger brother through as they get older, um, uh, continuing the story of Leningrad post World War II. So uh, yeah, that was a really great book to start on. I would say it's quite harrowing. So if you're not in the mood for something darker and something um, that talks about, you know, starvation and the means that people go to when they're starving to survive, then um, maybe don't do this one at this time. It was a little bit potentially the wrong timing to read it right now, but I'm still really glad that I read it. All right. The next book is my audiobook for the month of July, and I read Looking for the Rain, The Radiant and Radical Life of Lorraine Hansberry by Imani Perry. This was a wonderful, wonderful book. Um, I wouldn't say that the narrator was my favorite. Her tone of voice is very, very calm and rather... Um, slow paced at speaking. So I did increase the pace uh, up to 1.25 to listen. And that was like, to me, a regular pace to listen to it. So you could even probably have increased it up to two, uh, two times speed. Um, but the content of this book was um, just amazing. And Manny Perry um, has a kind of a ment or a, a hero heroine relationship with Lorraine Hansberry based on her own upbringing, which she talks about at the beginning of the book. And um, then she goes into, you know, all the details that you'd expect in a really good biography from Lorraine Hansberry's early life through um, her, she had a very short life. She died when she was 34 of cancer. And, um, but she had so much that she contributed to the civil rights movement 
to the culture of um, Black America and um, obviously writing the first um, play that was uh, produced on Broadway by Black women, A Raisin in the Sun, which I still have not uh, read or watched uh, yet, but I will definitely be doing that in the future. I would also like to read um, more of Lorraine's other works. She wrote a lot of different plays. She wrote a lot of essays. She wrote short stories. She was very, she did a lot of writing for, you know, a short life. She was also extremely good friends with James Baldwin and Nina Simone. And I found that really interesting because um, Amani Perry talks about how she has kind of faded compared to James Baldwin and and uh, Nina Simone and how she was so influential to both of them um, and that her legacy is kind of in the shadows. And so this book really was working to bring her legacy out of the shadows and um, give, give her her status where she belongs beside them. I also thought that Amani Perry did a great job of dissecting James Baldwin's work because Lorraine and, and James, whom she called Jimmy, were so close and they were they had a really interesting working relationship and a really interesting thinkers friendship where they challenged each other's ideas and pushed each other. Um, that was really interesting and so Amani Perry does kind of dissect his work a bit and talks about Lorraine's impressions of his work. Um, as he was making them so th that was also really interesting and the other part of the book that was really interesting was the fact that Lorraine was um, a lesbian and considered herself a lesbian but she was closeted um, for obvious reasons during that time this is also um, the McCarthy era and so there was a lot of things that Lorraine had to keep hidden about herself she was married um, but her and her husband had more of a, you know, friendship, um, respectful, distant relationship that they, they never divorced, but they um, were not really living in a traditional type of um, husband and wife marriage. So very fascinating woman, very radical politics, which I totally aligned with and was really interested in learning about. And so I would highly recommend that book. I think it is excellent. I read three books for the Book Two Prize in um, in August, and I cannot tell you my impressions of them here, but I will just say uh, I read Ten Minutes Thirty Eight Seconds for Me in This Strange World by Elif Shafak. I read Women Talking by Miriam Taves, and I read Lanny by Max Porter. And all of these books I have made a vlog of, and that vlog will be up. Um, at the beginning of October, once the results for the Book Two Prize have been announced. The books I can tell you about. Uh, I read The Olive Root by Carol Drinkwater. And um, I've talked about Carol Drinkwater before. She, her memoirs are like top of my list, some of my favorites. And this is the continuation. This is the fourth in her installment of books around her olive farm, which is uh, close to Nice in the south of France. This book is about her travels as she was going through the route around the Mediterranean to try to trace the origins of olive oil and the oldest olive trees. So um, this is the south of France side of the Mediterranean and she traveled very extensively. This, this journey of hers was set to begin right around 9-11 and so obviously there was a lot of delays and a lot of issues. So the Olive Root by Carol Drinkwater traces the, her journey as she's trying to figure out the origin of olive oil and the olive trees. She's trying to find the oldest olive trees in the Mediterranean region and she's trying to figure out where the source of olive oil came from, which culture kind of developed it first. And so she travels to Lebanon, Syria, Tunisia, Malta, Israel, Greece, Turkey. Um, she, you know, talks about her travels in just, you know, a realistic way. She talks about the pitfalls. She talks about having to leave to go back to the farm when their olive harvest fails. Um, she talks about the weather that she experiences, the different people in the cultures. Um, it's just, it was actually fascinating. And I, you know, I don't really 
care very much about the history of the olive per se, but the way she writes things makes me want to read them. And I just really enjoyed it. I think it is slightly dated in terms of her descriptions. I mean, she obviously is meeting so many different types of people in so many different cultures all around the Mediterranean. And um, sometimes I think her terminology was would not be terminology she would use today um, in descriptions of people. Um, but other than that, you know, to me, this is just, it was just fascinating to hear her perspectives on, um, you know, searching through this, this ancient culture and trying to figure, cult cultures, multiple cultures, and trying to figure out, you know, how they use olive oil, where olive oil comes into their histories. Um, and she never really, you know, spoiler alert, she never really determines anything concrete because this isn't really um, what the book is about. It's not really about, you know, a scientific analysis of these origins, but more of a personal journey that she's taking to satisfy her curiosity and to obviously write about it and tell other people about it. So uh, for me, this was a really interesting, I didn't know anything about Lib Libya. Um, and, and just, you know, especially, um, with the fire, the, the large explosion that happened in Lebanon, it was interesting to just, and the subsequent war that's been happening in Syria, it was really interesting to learn about this time period in these places, um, pre Arab spring, pre a whole bunch of things that have happened, um, subsequently, um, in the later, um, 2010s, etc. So. Yeah, I, I really would recommend this. I think it was excellent. Writing a Woman's Life by Carolyn G. Hilbrin. Um, this book is a nonfiction. It is feminist theory, um, very short, covering um, Virginia Woolf, covering a lot of different female writers from a, from a specific decade um, ar around the um, late 20s into the 30s and how they influenced the way women write about their lives and how they kind of changed it. And this is pretty very much around white women culture because um, there, the other women of color, black women, had a different perspective that they were writing from from the beginning. And so they didn't really have the same um, constraints on them that white women were writing under. And so um, that is very much talked about in here. There's a lot of intersectional um, thought processes and it was really great to read some feminist theory um, and I did a whole review on this book um, which I will link down below if you're interested in learning more about it but I really enjoyed this and I think it's um, really going to be helpful to me as I move forward thinking about how I document my own life in my artwork. Read this absolutely excellent poetry collection Copper Woman by Afua Cooper. Afua Cooper is a Canadian uh, author and uh, of Jamaican descent and this poetry was just stunning. Um, my favorite sections were where she brought in kind of mythology um, you know into the stories so from different cultures but the way she wrote these very um, spiritual poems were absolutely beautiful. Um, there's also, you know, a bit of political commentary in here. Um, there's some personal poems, um, some kind of love, love relationship poems. Those were probably my least favorite, um, but I still thought they were quite good. So overall, this is a wonderful poetry collection. And, you know, I'm really excited to be able to um, explore more Black Canadian authors. And so I feel like picking a Fuwa Cooper to start off with, um, with poetry was a good choice because she just has a way with words that is stunning. And my last finish of August was Bear by Marion Engel. Um, so this book, is part of my 1970s project. Uh, and so I'm getting very close to being able to wrap up my first 10 books in this project. And this is a very, you know, controversial book. Um, it was banned as pornography in many places. It won the Governor General's Award in Canada. It's very short, it's a, little, it's a novella really. 
and it's about a woman who is an archivist, a biographer, bibliographer, um, so a kind of introverted loner type woman who goes into Northern Ontario and stays on an island that was colonized um, by a um, settler in the late 1800s or the mid 1800s and uh, this color the settler family and um, this the home the island the the home that is on it and all the contents of the home have been left to the institute that this woman Lou works for and so she's been sent there to catalog it for the summer and um, she's very excited to go off on her own and, and have this adventure um, on this island for the summer when she gets there she's told that there is a bear that lives there too and this is kind of this eccentric strange family's pet and so they've always had a bear and she's kind of uh, confused and, and she's like what's happening i have to take care of a bear and he's like yeah just treat the bear like a dog you know but it's still a wild animal so be careful um and so as Lou gets more accustomed to her surroundings in this very wild and isolated place, um, she befriends this bear. And the bear is so much a symbol of her own connection to herself. And while she's befriending this bear, she also develops a uh, sexual relationship with this bear. So if you are in, not interested in um, hearing details of something like that, then I would not recommend you read this book uh, because, you know, I think this book does push a boundary that a lot of people are not willing to go over. And so I just wanted you to know in advance that if you're not willing to go over that boundary, don't read it because you really won't get anything out of it. I think if that's going to be a deal breaker for you, just don't read it. <laughs> um, if you can look at that in a more um, removed way and kind of see the symbolism of it, this book is amazing. I mean, I really think that what she did here was a masterpiece. <laughs> um, and having read a whole bunch of other books in the same time period by some of her contemporaries, so Margaret Lawrence, Margaret Atwood, um, I really see what she was trying to do here and I think she did it the best out of anyone I've read so far and that is um, a woman coming into her own sense of self removed from her relationship her, her seeing herself in relation to the way men see her and, the, and so and also connecting with the wild self connecting with your primal self in a place of nature so i just you know it, it it is so well done there's nothing in here that's um superfluous it's exactly the amount that you need it takes place over one summer in that way i think this would be a good summer read a good beach read a good readathon read it's really short um take you like you could read it in one sitting if you wanted to it really has so many interesting ideas and it can take you your brain into a lot of places and yes you know I totally get the fact that it would be difficult for people to get past the um, the sexual parts of the book so again like if that is not your thing then I don't recommend <laughs> you read this um, I, I, I think for me, um, this book has so much profoundness, so many interesting um, angles to go from. And I will talk about it more in relation to the other books I read um, in the 1970s project, because I definitely see a pattern forming, especially for myself and the things that I enjoy reading about. And um, yeah, this book fits right into that. So I have another Marion Engel uh, on my shelf. I will definitely be reading through her um, books. She, her writing style is very accessible. Um, I would say um, more accessible than Margaret Atwood for sure. 
Um, she just has um, a quite a nice flow to her writing that um, I definitely want to read more of. So I, I did really enjoy this. And the last book that uh, I was set to read for August was A Bird in the House by Margaret Lawrence. And I am not finished. I've gotten through two stories so far. There are eight um, stories, short stories in this collection, and they are interconnected short stories. They are all about uh, Vanessa McLeod, and they are set in Manawaka, which is Lawrence's fictional town where she set her um, Governor General award-winning book, The Diviners, which is my favorite novel of all time, still. And um, so it's great to be back in the town. It's interesting to read about Manawaka from this perspective, for Vanessa's perspective. It starts off as she's a 10 year old. And so the first two stories, she's around the same age, 10, 11. I'm thinking that as Vanessa gets older and her experience starts to be more out in the town, then these stories will kind of move out into the town too. Um, yeah, so enjoying them so far. I love Margaret Lawrence's writing. Lawrence is definitely one of my favorite authors. And um, these stories, you know, are just wonderful looks at life. Um, they're, they're looking at those little moments where children are learning about the adult world for the first time and starting to really understand that how complicated life actually is instead of just being in their, in their little child bubble. So that is all I have to say about August 2020. Thank you so much for watching and I will be back again soon with another video. Please subscribe if you are interested in seeing more. And if you'd like to connect with me on Goodreads or Instagram or any other places that I am uh, frequent, you can find all that information in the description box down below. I'll talk to you again soon.